All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. After using just reinforcement unsuccessfully, Jonah decides he wants to add a response cost procedure to his intervention plan. Which of the following answer choices most represents a response cost procedure? So we're looking at a response cost. And a response cost is a negative punishment procedure where reinforcement that was earned or given is removed. So Jonah decides he wants to use this response cost and add it to just the reinforcement plan. So what answer choice represents what a response cost might look like? A, each time the client asks to play video games, they are told that they must first either complete homework or complete a chore. So A could be a number of things. It could be using the pre-MAC principle. It could be using the threat or the requirement of the homework or chore as positive punishment. Either way, it isn't representing any sort of negative punishment or removal, so A is not right. B, tally marks act as reinforcement for a client as they are working. If the client pushes material off the table, a tally mark is erased. Good, we have the reinforcement that is given, which are the tally marks. If the client engages in this target behavior, the tally mark is removed. It's a negative punishment procedure. It's a response cost procedure. C, anytime the client attempts to take a cookie from the pantry before dinner, they must sit in their room for five minutes without their toys. Now, careful here, right? What are we doing to the client? What's the, the consequence for the client? The client is, go, is, is being sent to timeout. So C is actually a timeout procedure, not necessarily a response cost procedure. The much more accurate representation of response cost is going to be B. Josh helps pack boxes of baked goods at a local bakery. Josh is able to pack boxes quickly, but his boss is always telling him to slow down and focus on quality over quantity. Josh can pack about 12 boxes each minute. What is Josh's approximate average inter-response time? The question is focused on inter-response time, which of course is time in between responses. So if we're thinking about this particular question where jo Josh is packing boxes, and he's doing it quickly, and we know he can pack 12 boxes each minute, how are we going to find into response time? Well, we need to think about how long Josh takes in between each box if he's packing 12 boxes in a minute. And how we're going to do that is we're going to divide 60, because we have 60 seconds in a minute, by 12, and that's going to give us five seconds. Now, of course, this is just approximate because we're not real sure, right? We're just taking an approximate average, but we're just trying to answer the question. And the question is, approximately, how long in between each box? Well, if Josh is packing 12 boxes in a minute, then he's taking approximately five seconds in between each box. Meredith is the behavior analyst on a difficult case that requires a large multidisciplinary team of parents, therapists, and educators who all have a responsibility to the client. As the behavior analyst, what must Meredith do in this situation? So we are required to collaborate and work as a part of a team. And just because we are the behavior analyst doesn't mean we're always going to be in charge, and it doesn't mean we always know the most. In this case, Meredith, who is a behavior analyst, works on a large team. And she and the therapists and educators all have a responsibility to the client. As the analyst, what does Meredith need to do? A, establish herself as a leader on the team and delegate responsibilities. Well, that's not necessarily true. That's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes you may be in charge and delegating. Other times, you might have a situation where the parents are very involved and they want to be the ones calling the shots. And in that case... That is certainly going to be their right. B, state her role on the team and what her responsibilities are as a stud coder. Yes, you need to establish early on what is your role on the team? What are you going to be bringing to the table? 
What are your responsibilities? Not only is this going to let the other team member members know what you're providing, it's also going to give you some protection if you're asked to do something that you don't feel is your responsibility. So you need to be upfront about what you are there for to do. C, focus only on behavioral issues and allow the other stakeholders to focus on their area of expertise. Yes, you want to focus on your behavioral issues and you don't want to necessarily get in the way of others, but we are a collaborative people. We need to be collaborating, not just putting our head down, focusing only on what we're doing. We need to be aware of what else is going on on the team. D, evaluate the other team members' plans and provide feedback on what needs to change. If you're asked to do this, then yes, you can give advice or your opinion, but it is not your job or responsibility to evaluate these other plans and recommend things be changed unless you're asked to do so. You need to think about what am I there for? What are my responsibilities? And so doing that, you need to tell everyone exactly your role and your responsibilities as a stakeholder. Solomon will hurt himself for attention. Each instance of Solomon hurting himself looks like a rapid scratching of his own arm or leg. Which of the following measurement choices would be least appropriate to use to record this behavior? So when we're, t when we're choosing our measurement system, we want to choose the measurement that's going to give us the best data. Good data are accurate, valid, and reliable. But we also want data that we can use when we're trying to increase or decrease behavior. In this case, if Solomon is hurting himself and we likely want to re reduce that behavior and we know the hurting himself is a rapid scratching of his own arm or leg, what does that tell us? What well, tells us it's going to happen very quickly. So what might we not want to use for a behavior that happens very fast? A, duration. Sure, how are we going to take dur duration? How are we going to take duration on a behavior that happens rapidly. That's going to be very challenging. If it's rapid and only at last one to two seconds, duration is not going to be a great measurement to get a good idea of how often or how frequently this behavior is occurring. It's going to be much better likely to take frequency, count how often it's happening, or rate how many times per minute or per hour, or even into response time where we can figure out how long does Solomon go in between hurting himself. But duration for a rapid behavior is not going to provide a lot of information outside of maybe a very small window of time where the rapid scratching can actually occur. Ethically, punishment must be evaluated and measured on a constant basis. Which of the following is not true about punishment in ABA? So punishment in ABA is typically thought of as a last resort because we always want to try things like reinforcement first. However, punishment is just reducing behavior. There's a time and a place for it. We just have to do it correctly. This question just wants to know what is not true about punishment in ABA. Hey, punishment is not permanent. What does that mean? Well, that means if we stop punishment or if we keep using the same punishment without a replacement behavior, the effects of, those, of that punishment is very likely to wear off. Punishment does not always permanently suppress behavior. And we have to be aware of that. B, punishment can induce aggression or emotional responses. Well, of course, right? Punishment induced aggression is a very real thing. Punishment can lead to emotional reactions from clients or learners. C, punishment intensity should start low and increase rapidly. What's the rule about punishment intensity? We want to deliver the largest magnitude of punishment that is feasible and that is ethical that we can manage. Punishment should not build up. You want to deliver strong punishment from the beginning. So C is not true. D, punishment function is more important than punishment form when evaluating it as a consequence. Is how punishment looks more important than its effect or its effect on the environment? Of course not, right? The effect on the environment is going to be the most important thing for our consequences. So what we need to know here, what is not true about punishment is that punishment intensity should start low and increase rapidly. We want to start punishment intensity or magnitude as high as possible. 
Artie struggled to pay attention in school until he learned how to read simple and complex sentences. Now, Artie is exploring more advanced academic opportunities, communicating more effectively, and finding new interests through reading. Learning to read is most related to the idea of what. Now, this is a difficult concept because of the other idea of a pivotal behavior. It's kind of hard to distinguish sometimes between behavior cusps and pivotal behaviors. A lot of times, they're both one and the same, right? In this case, what has reading done for Artie? Well, it's opened up more opportunities, more chances for reinforcement. Simply reading simple and complex sentences has opened new doors for Artie. And so when we learn a behavior that opens new doors for reinforcement and opportunity, what do we call that behavior? A, behavior momentum. Well, we're not building behavior momentum here, right? This is not related to a high or low probability behavior. Response generalization. We're not necessarily looking at response generalization. We have a bunch of different responses and opportunities that are simply a result of already learning to read. What we would consider this is a behavior cusp. It's opened Artie's world up, right? And so behavior cusp and pivotal behaviors are very similar but they're still a little different. If we're looking at a behavior that is opening the world up to somebody, opening opportunities for reinforcement and opportunity, we're thinking typically along, along the lines of a behavior cusp. And of course, it's not a generalized condition reinforcement because we are looking at the behavior and the responses. Doug uses an ABAB design to examine the effectiveness of a typing class on typing speed in teenagers. The average baseline was around 50 words per minute, and the average for the intervention was around 65 words per minute. When Doug went back to baseline, the average stayed around 65 words per minute. What might be occurring? Question was to know what occurred here. Well, what do we know? We know we're using an ABAB design, so a with reversal withdrawal design. Baseline was 50 words. Intervention was 65 words. So you went from here to here. There was an increase from baseline to intervention. Now, what increased? Well, the speed of typing. What do we know about teaching a skill or teaching using, te you, teaching using an intervention? Well, some things you teach can't go back to the way it was before. So if we've increased typing speed, just because we removed the intervention, doesn't necessarily mean the typing speed is gonna drop again because it's a skill that was learned. So when Doug went back to baseline and the average stayed around 65 words per minute, what was being represented? A, a skill acquisition intervention cannot be withdrawn. It can be withdrawn. We just have to be aware of the idea of irreversibility. Or if you're teaching a skill, sometimes we can't reverse what was taught. It's not reversibility, right? It's irreversibility. And then multiple treatment interference is taking place. Well, there appears to only be one intervention. And all we know is we use that intervention to teach something. When we try to remove the intervention, the behavior still remained. Likely, irreversibility is occurring. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout-out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.